Okay. Welcome fellow Toastmasters and guests. This meeting of online presenters has now begun. Guests, please note that in order to be a member of our club, you must be a current or a former active member of Toastmasters International and have completed at least six Toastmasters official speeches. If you have substantial presentation experience, you may apply for membership after demonstrating your ability in a two to three minute speech delivered during one of our club meetings. All requests for membership are subject to approval by the members of our club. If you have not already done so, please change your panel to ensure that it shows your name and role if you have one this today. Right click and select rename in order to do so. We have members and guests from many countries throughout the world. So as a professional organization, we ask that you please be aware of language and word usage that may be considered offensive or otherwise insensitive due to cultural differences. Please note we are recording the meeting and your audio and video may contribute to our club marketing activities. Also, please mute your microphone when you are not speaking. And at this point, I'd love to turn it over to our club president, DTM Lou Brown. Thank you, Madam Sergeant at Arms. Welcome everyone. Always so wonderful to see everyone's smiling faces here every week. Welcome back to some of our veteran Toastmasters who live in somewhat unaccommodating time zones. Really appreciate you being with us here at, at those odd hours of the night and morning. So again, thanks for being with us. We have a very full meeting today consisting of three speeches as well as I'll call it a bonus speech later in the program run by our Vice President Membership, Marianne Grady. And with that, let's get things started right away. I will turn it over to our Toastmaster of the day, Toastmaster Leeming. Thank you so much, Mr. President Liu, my fellow Toastmasters and our most welcome guests. I'd like to welcome everyone to Online Presenters Toastmasters. I'm Kim Leeming and it's my honor to be Toastmaster of the day for this evening. The theme of the day is it's a small world. The word of the day is cyberspace. Now that recent events have caused a lot of us to transform our careers and lives from interacting in person to mainly interacting online, the concept of it's a small world is even more relevant than ever. The definition of cyberspace is the electronic medium of computer networks in which online communications takes place. I don't know about you, but this sounds exactly like the Webster Dictionary description of online presenters, Toastmasters. Cyberspace allows users to share information, interact, swap ideas, engage in discussions or social forums, conduct business, and create intuitive media. Sounds like our meetings, right? It's a small world, but I wouldn't want to paint it. He also said, Everywhere is within walking distance if you have the time. Cyberspace is continuing to make our world seem smaller and smaller. Online presenters is a great example of this. Through cyberspace, we're able to interact from all over the world in what seems like an intimate environment. Although thousands of miles separate us, and although it's already tomorrow for some of us who are here, it seems as though we're all here together each week as friends. Victor Borga once said, laughter is the closest distance between two people. Although it's always been true, it's cyberspace that makes this happen even more often. So let's get on to tonight's meeting. Our meetings here at Online Presenters consist of three main parts. The first part is the prepared speeches. This is where three people present a speech for a particular project within their Toastmasters pathway. The second part is table topics. This is the impromptu speaking part of the meeting where we get the chance to practice speaking off the cuff. And the final part is the evaluation portion of the meeting. Each of the three speakers will receive an evaluation. This is a great opportunity for all of us to learn the, from the valuable and actionable feedback each speaker receives. It may seem like Toastmaster Day runs a meeting. However, it's actually a team effort. 
I will now introduce the people who will be assisting me today. They will each have one minute to describe their role for tonight's meeting. The timer for today's meeting is April LZ. April, would you please tell us your duties as a timer? Greetings, Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters and guests. As timer, I will be timing the table topic speakers, the prepared speeches, as well as the evaluations. And I will be doing so with the virtual backgrounds. So for the table topics, I will display the virtual background at the one minute, I will display the green display as I have now. At the one minute, 30 seconds, I will display the yellow background. At the two minutes, I will display the red background. And I would also do the same at the prepared speeches. Looks like tonight or today, our prepared speeches are five to seven minutes at length. So at five minutes, I would display the green background. At six minutes, I would display the yellow background. At seven minutes, I would display the red background. And for the individual evaluations, they should be between two to three minutes. And for that, at two minutes, I would display the green virtual background. At two minutes and 30 seconds, I will display the yellow background. And at three minutes, I will display the red background. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, April. Next up is our awe counter. Today's awe counter is... Not here. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Ah, that wonderful sound after you've enjoyed a drink. And as you go across cyberspace today, we're asking you to be focused whether or not you're eating or drinking and watch out for those bumps because you might just say ah at the wrong time. It may be not, not that, it may be other things, but I will tell you things that did not make your ride smooth from one cyber area to another. Toastmaster of the day, I will tell you what I found out. Thank you, Donna. Next up is our grammarian, Pamela Benjamin. Pamela, could you please talk about your duties for tonight? Don't believe that Pamela is here. Uh-oh. So who wants to take over the role of grammarian? Since we have three speeches, uh, Madam Toastmaster, might I suggest that we simply uh, don't do a grammarian's role tonight? Thumbs up for me. Okay. So next up is our watcher. Tonight's watcher is Marianne Grady. Marianne, could you please share your duties for tonight? Certainly. Every breath you take, every move you make, I'll be watching you. Uh, seriously, my job is to make sure that we are framed properly, that we're using uh, our backgrounds in the right way and not behaving in any type of distracting manner, but I will be watching and reporting later. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Marianne. I love that song. I hope you sing the rest of it later in the after party. So tonight's chat monitor is Rick Durling. Rick, would you please describe your role for tonight? Absolutely. As chat monitor today, I am going to be keeping an eye on everything you post in cyberspace. I'm going to be looking for interesting things. For instance, the worldwide temperatures range from 3 degrees Celsius or 38 to 30 degrees Celsius or 86 currently as reported in our chat session. Back to you. Thank you, Rick. Our vote counter for tonight is Lou Brown. Lou, could you please talk about your role for tonight? Sure, as vote counter, I will be tabulating votes for best speaker, best table topic speaker, and best evaluator, and sending links via the chat. This is my first time using the voters tool. Wish me luck. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Lou, and good luck with the tool. This brings us to the prepared speeches portion of the meeting. Our first speaker tonight is Andy Byrne. His speech is titled, oh, I'm not sure. And it's from the Team Collaboration Pathway. I'm so sorry, I need to look that up. Um, please make, welcome. Make the right choice. Make the right choice from the Team Collaboration Pathway Level 2, Learning Your Style. Level Please three. welcome BTM 3, Andy Byrne. 
make the right choice. I'm so sorry, Andy. Go ahead. That's okay. Okay. Having a Okay, my uh, technical difficulty here. While you're sorting, uh, Andy. Let me switch uh, from my position to uh, number three's position in speaking so that I can attend the technical difficulties. Because I had this working before we started, so. You're number uh, two? Kim, you're muted. So oh, sorry. Okay, so our new first speaker for tonight is Trisha Smith. And her speech is titled Good Communication Requires a Plan. This is from Visionary Communication Level 3, Increasing Knowledge, Develop a Communication Plan. Please welcome PM3, Trisha Smith. Good Communication Requires a Plan. Good communication requires a plan. My communication plan is structured strategically. It is the goal is to inform others of my business goals, to educate and inform others as a health coach, and to reach my audience. Who's my audience, you ask? Anyone who's interested in my products and changing their lives for the better. I would like to focus my audience on teens, middle-agers, and women. I'm gonna talk about my communication plan for my business, my sideline home business, my steps, how I'm gonna implement my plan and how I'm gonna evaluate my plan. Good evening, fellow Toastmasters, friends and guests. My communication plan is focused on my sideline home business called All Natural Care Pantry Gift Baskets and Gifts. See my gifts in the back. Here's my story. I started this sideline business part-time back in 1993. It's been a passion for a long time. Unfortunately, a sideline because I work full-time. I'd like to give more time to this business. What is this business? It's a gift basket business. It started as a gift basket business with a focus on teas and herbal products. I used to do herbal hour home parties and I used it to benefit myself, my family, my friends, and my community. I participate with vendor shows, community events, activities, and now there's a whole world out there with online options. So my goal with my communication plan is to reestablish my business with an online platform and use multiple methods of communication to reach out and have a wider audience. What types of communication will I be using? I will be using as many different methods as possible. I don't know all the social media platforms. I'm aware of them. Facebook, Facebook groups. I like to blog, YouTube videos. I even wanna do a Shopify and Amazon store. I wanna reestablish and redevelop my website and have membership options. Big plans. My communication plan started with my story. So I wanna share my story and get my passion out there on how I like to help others and make a difference in the lives of other people. I wanna use my health coach platform on educating and informing others on nutrition, healthcare, natural healthcare products, personal care products, exercise and environmental living and incorporate my products to meet those needs and expand different types of products from gift baskets to boxes to DIY membership boxes. That's a big one these days. Um, and other 
methods and other means based on the needs of my clients and customers. My communication plan is based on SMART goals. So specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. How are they specific? When I participate in activities as a vendor, farm markets, auctions, community vendor, arts and craft shows, things like that, uh, they, I try to time it about once a month. That's a good limit because it does take about that long to prepare for things. And there's a cost to it. So specifically, I am going to develop a strategic plan, a step-by-step -step approach systematically and a process where I create, design, develop everything I'm going to use to attend the event, invite and inform my audience or participants, send reminders. I'm going to implement those the way that I go about the activity, and I'm going to evaluate each step of my process for everything I do, whether it's a blog, a YouTube, an event, and incorporate the feedback that I get to meet the needs of the people that are served. It's measurable because my process is very strategic and structured, and I'm a very systematic person, so I always try to refine things and make them better with everything I do. It's attainable because I have experience and a foundation with health coaching and with my sideline business and the way that I've been practicing it. It is relevant because I've been able to meet the needs of the customers, the clients, and the people that I serve. And I love making a difference in the lives of other people, making them better. My goal is to influence and persuade anyone that I can to change their lifestyle for the better, whether it's nutrition, healthy products, self-care, personal care, and environmental living, um, clean products for your cleaning at home, anything within your home, air fresheners, uh, air purifiers, water purifiers, generators, all those good things. They, there's a whole systematic approach to this, making your whole lifestyle around clean, healthy living and environmental living. And it is time bound. Right now, the times that I uh, participate are about on a monthly basis. Well, things are just opening up again after COVID. So they've been very restricted. So with all of these things in process and me being the only one, I don't have a team yet. It takes time to develop this. So I'm looking forward to developing all these things and I'm gonna evaluate everything along the way. In conclusion, I just talked about my communication plan, how, when, how often, I, and the frequency of how I'm going to participate in uh, activities and events, how I'm going to inform others and send reminders and my methods of communication, and how I have SMART goals to achieve those things to develop my business uh, to meet my needs. And I plan on implementing this January 2022, my New Year's resolution and goals, and I plan up a year of jubilee. Are you ready for a year of Jubilee? I am. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Our next speaker for the night is David Carr. David's speech is titled, Nothing to be Afraid of. Really? This is from Engaging Humor Level 3, Increasing Knowledge Using Descriptive Language. Please welcome DTM, David Carr. Nothing to be afraid of. Really? Toastmasters dwell way too much on overcoming fear. Public speaking is nothing to be afraid of. That's what we tell these poor souls who come to us looking for help. My message, <coughs> be afraid, be very afraid. There's plenty to be afraid of in public speaking. And that's particularly true when we step outside of cyberspace into the so-called real world. We talk as though the worst that could happen is you forget a line from your speech. We talk as though the worst that could happen is that your presentation technology will fail you at the worst possible moment, which of course it will, but that's not the worst that could happen. What about falling off the stage? Famous people who have fallen off the stage include Bob Dole, Kelsey Grammer, Remy Malik, it happened to Remy Malik at the Oscars, the year he won for playing Freddie Mercury. Some of you have been practicing the techniques of comics, trying to work humor into your speeches. 
Well, that's just going to lead to lots of crazy movement, which could lead to you falling off the stage. The comic Roz McCoy, there's a YouTube video of how hilarious it is that she fell off the stage. Now, the lighting was such that you don't actually see her hit bottom. You just hear her in the darkness saying, I'm all right. I'm embarrassed. We'll just do the show from down here now. Okay, somewhat smooth recovery. And we tend to value that kind of show must go on mentality. Teddy Roosevelt once got shot on his way to giving a speech and insisted on giving it anyway. Now, this is before the invention of the US Secret Service. He, he had bodyguards, they tackled the shooter. And the eyeglasses case in his pocket deflected the bullet enough that it went through his shoulder and to Teddy's judgment anyways, it was just a minor flesh wound. So he insisted on giving the speech. He got up, he spoke for 84 minutes. The Smithsonian has the dented glasses case and some bloodied pages of manuscript of what he was reading. And only after that speech did he agree to go to the hospital. Well, so being shot is an issue. Falling off the stage is the issue. Did your Toastmasters mentors warn you about that? I bet they did not. Don't let people fool you by thinking the worst thing that you have to worry about is butterflies, little, little butterflies. You've heard this, haven't you? Don't worry about the butterflies in your stomach. You just have to get the butterflies to fly in formation. You've heard that one? As if butterflies were the worst thing we have to worry about. What about crocodiles? The speaker in Stockholm was mauled by a crocodile. Now, I would think that if there was a place that you would be safe from crocodiles, it might be Stockholm, Sweden. If this had happened in Florida, people would say, ah, well, Florida. But in Stockholm, Sweden, this gentleman was gesturing. He was using big gestures, you know how they tell you you ought to? And a crocodile jumped up and bit him in the arm. Now, the reason I know about this is that I once gave a paid speech in Stockholm. That's the, the pinnacle to date of my paid speaking career, several years ago. And I blew the speaking fee by bringing my family along. And since then, my wife has been obsessed with Sweden and all things Swedish, including weird news items that she reads in the Swedish news and brings to my attention, such as this one. So I may have left out a few details about the crocodile in the speech, because it, you know when I gave my speech in, in Stockholm, I'm pretty sure I used arm gestures and I was not bitten by a crocodile. There did not appear to be a crocodile in the audience. This particular speech was at a crayfish party which is kind of like a Swedish lobster fest, I guess, but with crayfish that they do in August every year. And the crayfish party was at an aquarium and the aquarium has a couple of crocodiles that used to belong to Fidel Castro. Fidel gave them to a Russian cosmonaut who gave them to the Moscow Zoo and apparently the Moscow Zoo couldn't handle them. So they went looking for a crocodile expert to take care of them, which of course they found in Stockholm, Sweden. And the public speaker apparently was getting up on an earthen embankment, which he was trying to use as his stage, his makeshift stage at the venue. And he turned around and gestured. And I, I imagine him saying something like, look at these magnificent beasts but his gesture was just expansive enough that it went over the plastic barrier around the crocodile pit. And a crocodile trainer who's in the audience apparently was shouting out, no, don't do that. The arm went over the barrier. The crocodile decided it was lunchtime. Now the gentleman did survive. He lost a lot of blood apparently, but there were medically trained people in the audience who were able to bandage him up, 
with tablecloths and napkins until the ambulance got here. So we lived. There aren't too many fatalities that I found in public speaking, but it's a dangerous business. And so the moral of the story is know your venue. Know where the edge of the stage is so that you don't step over it. Watch out for assassins lurking outside the theater and pay attention, watch out for crocodiles and anything else that could go wrong. Toastmaster. Thank you, David. So just so you know, I'm super afraid. So I definitely can relate to what you're saying. And tonight, although I didn't fall off the stage because there is really no stage with an online presenters meeting, I actually tripped over the tripod and have quite the bruise on my rib cage. So can totally relate to what you're saying. So our third speaker for tonight is Andy Byrne. His speech is titled, Make the Right Choice. This is from the Team Collaboration Pathway Level 3, Learning Your Style. Please welcome DTM Andy Byrne, Make the Right Choice. Andy, have you overcome your technical difficulties? I thought I did. I switched up completely. And let me just. All right. So let me go here. We do see your presentation. Do you see the presentation? Yes. Okay. I just move this around. All right. Thank you very much, Kim. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Uh, today we're going to talk about make the right choice. And what I want you to think about when you do your presentations is visual impact. This project is team collaboration creating effective visual aids. It's five to seven minutes, and we'll start on the clock right now. The first thing I wanna share with you is as you're looking at this whole issue of using visual aids, you want to use the right tool at the right time with the right purpose. And what do I mean by that? You have two components of visual aids. Now, why do we even think about visual aids? The first reason for visual aids is that they've shown in studies that your visual connection with a presentation is the most memory rich part of how you learn. That's why you enjoy movies so much because you have sight, you have sound, and sometime in the future, maybe you'll even have smell. But right now, sight, sound, pictures, music, all those things have one purpose, and that's to make a connection, an emotional connection with you so that everybody feels the same way. And when the movie is over, you take the message home and maybe act on it. So these are some of the things that they teach you. Now, when it comes to visual aids, there's a lot of different choices. When you look at visual aids, you want to look at what are you trying to do? Well, the most important thing is you're trying to support your speech. And there are many different options. I'll be happy to send this to anybody as a PDF at the end so you have the information. But the basic thing is you have to select what it is. Now, if I went back and said, I'm giving a presentation on my time as a soldier in the battlefield, and there was a major explosion and everybody around me got blown up. It's one thing to do word pictures and to raise your voice and to pause and to all of that. But when you actually include a picture, it has a more meaningful connection with the audience. When you look at thinking about the whole issue of speeches, and how you put that together from an idea to a delivered speech, we teach in Toastmasters that you wanna to think of major things. 
The major things that we talk about is a strong opening, a foundational message, a body in the message where you have several points that could be pictures, stories, other things, and then a closing statement with a summary. But all in all, as you're preparing that, you want to have a call to action and you want to have a foundational message. Well, what do I mean by a foundational message? I mean that when you deliver the speech, when you're all done, people can say that speech was good because I took this away. It affected me in such and such a way. Looking at it, it's really complicated when you think of what are your choices? Because you're not only talking about the visuals, it's how you deliver the visuals. Now, I was going to demonstrate work with the program AHAM, which you see in yellow over there, but I had a problem that I have to figure out in the future. And when you're thinking major presentations, you have PowerPoint, Keynote, and Slides. That's Microsoft, Apple, and Google. Those are the major players in presentation. But it's come to be that there are many other creative outlets as well. You have Canva, where you can do multiple slides and bring them together. You have, as I said, over the last year, a program called AHAM, which reduces the learning curve of having to do things like OBS or some of the other software that's out there. You have Prezi, you have beautiful AI, you have pictures, you have videos, you have Canva that you can do in multiple ways, and you have audience engagement. As you're doing your presentation, you can ask questions, you can curate questions, and you can do that with either the polls that exist within Zoom, or you can do that on an ongoing basis from your smartphone with a program called VBox. That becomes more important as you're looking towards the future, and you're seeing that many clubs are making the decision to go hybrid. Well, how do you count the votes if some people are online and other people are in the room and trying to combine all those votes? In that circumstance, VBox is the answer because everyone can get on their smartphone, put in the number, and then as the questions are popping up on your screen, you can answer that and it gets all collated through the program. So what was my central idea or message? Think about that. What was I talking about? What's the whole focus of this? We started talking about making the right choice for visual impact in your speeches. Visual impact is found to be the most memorable thing. Software to help, there are many, many options and you wanna choose the right program. Audience engagement, is as simple as asking a question at the beginning of the presentation. You want to keep the attention on you. And what I was going to demonstrate before my technology failed is that in this setting where I'm using slides from Keynote, it's taking up the whole screen. What I initially set up with the AHAM program allows me to change my size, change the slide appearance, and allow me to be in the slide at all times so that the focus of attention is on me as I focus on you. The call to action is the proper use of slides, and you can make your presentations great. Here's an example from Toastmasters manual itself of not following the rules. Here is a slide that they had and look how much they have on that slide for effective presentations and software. They have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight different lines of text. Most of the literature that's now out there says you wanna keep it to four or five words. You wanna have pictures associated with your slides so that it drives one's attention in that direction. What I want to share with you all is to know your tools, know your audience, know the central message, and how you can help your story. Thank you. Toastmaster of the day.
And thank you, Andy, for a very thought-provoking speech. Um, we now are going to, to go to our VP membership, Marianne Grady, for a message. Take it away, Marianne. Well, hello, everybody. As vice president of membership, there are times when we have somebody who doesn't have um, extensive Toastmaster experience, but they would still like to become a member of our club. So what we ask them to do is to put together a two to three minute prospective member speech. And tonight we are lucky enough to have somebody giving one. And that would be Intanon Mo Mo oh, Mosin. And he is coming to us as a, a former Toastmaster who has given an icebreaker and two other speeches. So I will give it right over to him to get started. Welcome, Intanon, and everyone give him a big round of applause. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Vice President, membership, the President, and the respectable fellow Toastmasters. So I'm here presenting my uh, speech to become a prospective member. I have already given the icebreaker, uh, but I don't know the meaning of icebreaker till I move to Alberta, where I actually have to break the ice on my uh, car's mirror. So now I understand that what is the meaning of icebreaker. And I am really afraid of uh, speaking in, in front of public. And uh, as the David said that the, you should be afraid. So I was very afraid when, when I gave my first speech. Uh, but, God, but, but, the, but the good thing is that there, is no, uh, there are no, no crocodiles there. So I was uh, safe from the crocodile. Uh, uh, because now actually now because of the COVID distribution is changing from physical to, uh, to cyberspace. Uh, but cyberspace has different requirements, but here you don't need to be more formal as compared to the physical one. You can uh, mute you, your, 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 your speaker and lots of things you can do it. But in physical, you have to be more attentive because I have also uh, attended, uh, I also participated in a humorous speech contest in which I have to deliver a humorous speech and my opinion is that the, the humorous speech is more difficult than the serious speech because you have to uh, play with the words so that people can laugh and people can enjoy. So, but uh, but the good, the good thing is that you should also you, you should also enjoy your speech. So that's why I like the humorous speech also. Uh, and I'm actually uh, looking uh, forward to be part of this group. The reason is that because. The people are very, uh, very experienced, and uh, they have lots of experience with, from which I can learn. And uh, and also my learning curve will be more steep as compared to the normal uh, postmaster club. And the good thing is a, is a mix of the culture of different continents, so I can find a different uh, different different dialects from the different people and uh, from the different uh, uh, different backgrounds. So this gives me also uh, more information about the people who are actually uh, around the world. So I'm really looking forward to be part of this uh, group. And, and I want a long-term membership, not a short-term, uh, because of the, of the cyberspace, because cyberspace connects you anywhere in, in the world. So, uh, so, so that's the reason. So thank you very much again for providing me this opportunity. And I'm looking forward to be part of this club. Thank you very much. <clears throat> well, thank you, Antonin. Uh, so happy you were able to join us. Now, at this time, I did check with Donna Knight, and we do have quorum to take a vote, and we'll do this via private chat to me. So please uh, put your votes through to me, and the results will be announced at the next meeting. Back to you, Madam Toastmaster. Thank you, Mary Ann. So again, our timer tonight is April LZ. April, could you please give a timer's report for the three speeches? I placed a timer's report in the chat. All three prepared speakers were eligible for voting. Thank you, April. So if everyone could please take a moment to cast your vote for best speaker of the day, that would be great. We now move on to the uh, impromptu table topics portion of the meeting. And tonight's table topic master 
is Andy Byrne. Please welcome Andy once again. And by the way, thank you, Andy, for stepping in at the last minute to do a speech. And we really appreciate that. So thank you, Andy, for Table Topics. Thank you very much, Kim. And the theme of the day is it's a small world. And I see from a lot of the people on the screen that they've taken that as a meaning to go to Disney. In my case, you see all the different dolls in Disney. So that's a small world. Other people have put up the Magic Kingdom and bring it put in Bellagio for the adults that want to have fun and take it to Las Vegas. But the theme is it's a small world. And so we'll start off with it's a small world and the holidays are coming up. So the question is, how are the holidays celebrated differently throughout the world from your home location? Because we have people from lots of different places represented. And I'm going to choose people in addition that uh, may have other roles, but they represent the diversity of our club. So first, April, tell us how the holidays are different in your culture, in your location, and in your family. It's a small world. Thanks, Table Topic Master. The holidays in my family, well, my family, my husband's military. So we live in Virginia and my family is down south in Mississippi and my husband's family is in New York. So. Most of our holidays is spent away from our families. Oftentimes, our holidays is just with us. Oftentimes, what we do is my husband could be deployed in order to make the holidays the best for my kids. If their father is deployed and he's away from them, I unfortunately, I have to bribe them. <laughs> So whatever they want for the holidays, I just typically get that for them to try to make the best of it in order to try to help them not have a bad Christmas because their father is away. And if he's able to call, then he will call from if he's out to sea, he's able to call them. So while he's active duty military, he's able to I mean, their holidays is not the best of holidays, but um, that's just what it, we are able to make out of it. Um, I just have to try to bribe them with toys in order to try to make the best of their holiday memories while he still is in the military. So it's not a nice and fuzzy, <laughs> warm memory of the holidays that I had as a kid, but as being military kids, it's just, that's just the best that we can, we can do while he's in the military. Back to you. Well, thank you, April. And please tell your husband, thank him for his service this past Veterans Day. We think about all the people that serve. As we now go to Miami, Lucas, what's different about the holiday celebration in Miami? I know that when I was in Fort Lauderdale, we had the boat parade. What can you say about the holidays in the small world of Miami? Sure, I'd be happy to share a little bit about that experience. Miami being a very Latin infused city, and I will talk about Thanksgiving in particular, you get this fusion of Cuban food with your stereotypical, your traditional Thanksgiving food. What that results in is having things like turkey and if I happen to go to my uncle's house, not only will I have the oven roasted turkey, but possibly a fried turkey. And I think he might venture out to do a smoked turkey. So we might have one or rather just all three. So if you can imagine that three turkeys all cooked in a different way is pretty fantastic. And then you get other things like plantains and rice and black beans and sometimes pork. That's the kind of infusion that you get at, at a Thanksgiving in Miami. And I'm sure in other holidays, you also get that as well, but that's what makes the holiday great. 
because you get to try a variety of foods, some new things, as well as things that you might be used to having pretty much anywhere else in the United States for Thanksgiving. Back to you, Table Topics Master. Thank you very much, Lucas. In the middle of the Indian Ocean, there's a small island country that Christians are part of. How are the holidays celebrated down there compared to how we celebrate it up here in the United States? I'm tempted to say on the beach, Mr. Table Topics Master. <laughs> However, <laughs> with the lockdown and COVID related situations at the moment, it's not. So holidays are spent in family because everyone is related to everyone. If you look at the history of how people came to the island, it was a little group of people who decided to be happy and live and get married together. And it started, hopefully there was no inbreeding, but it grew <laughs> up, it grew up, it grew up. So in a way, if, if you look at my surname, Ramchun, and there's someone else called Ramchun in a meeting, I have to be careful not to say the wrong thing, especially if it's a girl and I'm a boy, that was before marriage and you know, can get messy there uh, because everyone's related to everyone. But coming back to holidays, it's about spending time with with the family you want to spend, the family members you want to st spend time with because there are all those family members we want to stay away from and then there are all those family members who we want to hug and then they tell you, no, it's COVID, stay away. Uh, it's usually with the family, ideally at the beach, if not in the comfort of your house, over a nice hot meal, the local food of your choice, and it's a melting pot of food as well. So yeah, good food, family, and that's it. Back to you, Mr. Table Topics Master. Okay, Brigid, I know that you had spent some time in Germany during your business travels and some family over there as well. What's it like in Europe, in particular Germany during the holidays? I've got two words when it comes to holidays in Germany, Christmas markets. Christmas markets are this amazing time. They start at the beginning of Advent actually. And that basically means that there are, every town has one and there are just rows and rows of stands. And it's all very traditional. You hear a lot of traditional music. You see a lot of handcrafted ornaments. Straw stars are huge when it comes to that. Also, nutcrackers and smokers that are hand carved, a lot of handmade jewelry, and the mulled wine. And there's going to be a different mulled wine station pretty much at every corner. So you'll have in a small town in a Christmas market, probably three or four. In some of the larger ones like Munich, you'll have maybe 10 different mulled wine stations and each one has a slightly different recipe. So it's pretty amazing because especially when you go with friends, everybody likes a different one a little bit better. And it's really fun because then you get into arguments about which one is better. And then you try some other ones and German sausages, etc., and a lot of music, um, a lot of musicians, a lot of choirs. And it's all in the spirit of Christmas, which culminates actually in Christmas Eve. We have Christmas Eve when it comes to Germany and the Christ child basically puts up the tree. It's not there for all of December. You put up the tree that evening, you send the children away, you start decorating it, the lights go up and there's a little bell that rings and the kids come down. They see all the presents, but first you have the family dinner. And my family, we used to have me play the guitar and do a couple songs, and then you would open the presents. Now, the cool thing is by the time you hit midnight mass, I already had my presents, nobody else did. So I was already wearing my new Christmas clothes, but it was nice because Christmas Eve is a lot more romantic than at waking up the morning with pajamas. And I would say my parents and I always continue to celebrate Christmas Eve. And that way, you know, we were just all open to meet with friends on Christmas day, middle of the day, but I'll never forget the Christmas markets. And every time I go back, I love to revisit them and I still celebrate Christmas Eve. Mr. Table Topics Master. Well, thank you very much. And we're gonna make a note of the fact that you can play guitar and sing and maybe you'll serenade us as we get closer to the holiday. Sure. Do I have Kim room for one more speaker? One more table topic? You absolutely do. You could I'd probably do two. Okay. 
First, I'd like to invite Kimberly, if she's willing, to share her thoughts about the holidays and the various places she's been for the holidays. What's unique about the way you do the holidays with your family, where you're currently living or have lived? The holidays for me is all about going home. When I go home on the holidays, everybody's waiting for me. Everybody is welcoming me. We have the hugest feast. We have turkey, wheat, sweet potato pie, everything you can imagine. They asked me to cook my favorite dinner. They asked me to cook my favorite desserts. They also asked me to ride around with them to visit other family members that we haven't seen in a while. It's also time when everybody that I went to school with that are still around in other parts of the world come together to see all of their families too. So it's all about being with family. You get to see the children, how they've grown up. And of course, they're looking for the gifts. Everybody's looking for the gifts. So I have to go down packed with gifts in bags. Still feel like Santa Claus when I go down because I have to have everything ready for them. And now there's a new granddaughter here. So that means even more gifts. That's a lot to do on the holidays, but when I go home, it really feels like home. It's really enjoyment and it's something that I look forward to for the whole year. And thank you very much, Kim. Donna, if you're still there, I know that you have unique traditions in the Caribbean. Tell us about yours. When I heard Bridget talk about Christmas markets, that's the same thing here. We have Christmas market and it is a joy. We take students, in the old days, we used to take students out to the market, Christmas market. So it had nothing to do with the families doing it then. And so the students would go and it would be a day of noise and fun and excitement and children would come from the country areas and they would be at the market, they would get time to shop. We also have different areas, different parts of the parishes where they have donkey ride and all kinds of excitement that take place. You have people who leave the town just to go for that kind of excitement. Of course, we have the seventh largest natural harbor in the world and we make use of that. And we have incorporated things from around the world in it. So on Christmas Eve, New Year's Eve, before COVID-19, we go down to the harbor and we have fireworks. It is beautiful because if you thought the Christmas market was over, you need to be down by the harbor. Now, we do have a little crime problem in Jamaica, but at that time, nobody worries. People go, it is so packed that you are worried about stepping on people's toes, but nobody is arguing with you that night. Everybody's just out having fun. Young lovers are there, old lovers are there, single people are there, and they're just enjoying the festive season. Of course, those of us who are hungry and on the street side, they are being fed left, right, and center. So you're not able to identify the homeless. That is one of the greatest things about that time of the year during the in that in those communities. Of course, we have the homes, and every home will celebrate it differently. For those of us who have our families come over, that's great. My household was a little different because I have a sister who is so afraid of balloons that we never had decorations. You could not blow a balloon near her. In fact, so many years later, you still cannot blow a balloon near her. But I am looking forward to celebrating Christmas, how I celebrate in my home. And I am sure others are looking forward to it, whatever COVID dictates. Table Topics Master. And for our last question, we've gone around the world and had some insight into everybody's celebrations and culture and geography. Let's not forget Australia. Graham, could you share a little bit about Dan Under and how you celebrate in your community and your Mr. household? Mr. Topics Master, fellow Toastmasters and guests, Christian made a joke about celebrating Christmas on the beach. It's no joke in Australia, I can tell you. You see, the thing is that because we are 
at the height of our summer, at the end of year celebrations at Christmas, then the beach or the pool is where Christmas is celebrated. You know, the, the, the hot turkey with all the trimmings and the roast um, ham and no, no, no. Prawns or shrimp, if you prefer. Cold chicken, cold meats, laid out on a platter, fighting off the flies because flies love Christmas, flies love summer. But Christmas in Australia is like it is everywhere else, I guess, about family. The holidays here are about taking stock of the year that's just gone past and re-energising with our family and our friends. In our particular case, we don't actually do anything here at our house because there's only my wife and I. So most years we end up at my sister's place because she's got a pool and pool is really important in mid-December in Australia where 35, 40 degrees, which is, I don't know, over 100 in your money, uh, is not at all unusual. So we nearly always end up at my sister's place. Uh, where you also spend time with my son and his fiance. They live a few suburbs away from us. Unfortunately, we don't spend time with my little girl because she's living in Portland, Oregon. And so we get to see her perhaps sometime in the new year. Please, if we're allowed to travel. But the thing about Christmas, the thing about the holidays is like everywhere, it's about re-energizing, de-stressing and eating far too much, which I'm not going to be doing this year. That's my promise to myself. Mr. Topics Master. Well, thank you very much. And I can share with you that all the members of this club are a family and thank you for sharing how you spent the holidays and just listening to everybody's talking about their experiences. I'm hungry and I can't wait for the meeting to end so I can eat something because you guys made me really hungry. Back to you, table uh, top master of the day. Thank you, Andy. That was actually a very fun table topic. Thank you so much to everyone for participating and sharing their stories. Um, April, our timer for the night, could you please tell us the timer's report for the table topics? All of the table topic timers, times are reported in the chat and all the times are qualified. Thank you, April. So if you could all please vote for your best table topics, that would be awesome. And our next portion of the meeting is the evaluations. This is the educational part of the meeting. Our general evaluator for tonight is Graham Carnes. He will lead the evaluation portion of the meeting. Please welcome Graham Carnes. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster. Once again, Toastmasters and guests. So I'm actually going to do the evaluations, not in the order of the speakers, but in the order of the evaluators, because it's easier to do it that way, uh, which means, uh, Christian, even though the speech that you were evaluating was the third speech, I'm going to be calling upon you first for a time of two to three minutes with uh, indications at two, two and a half and three, please, uh, Madam uh, Timekeeper. Our first evaluation tonight of the speech by Andy Byrne is Christian Ramchurn. Mr. General Evaluator, ladies and gentlemen, make the right choice when you present online. Why? Because it can be the make or break deal of you connecting with the audience and making your speech memorable. And thanks to his troubles today, I think he did that on purpose. Our VP Education, our first speaker, showed us what to do and what to avoid in an online session. Toastmaster Andy, thank you for pulling off what you did. I'm going to share with you where we can improve on this speech and I'm going to then move to what I really enjoyed with your whole message. Now, I, I'm going to also focus my delivery on the visual aids element of the speech. And this is what I saw as we started. If you can see my screen, boom. I see a slide deck and the slide deck wasn't moving as you were speaking. Now, on a personal note, and this is where I also fa failed, I should have just stepped in and say, Andrew, can you just check, check that your slide is moving? But I didn't want to do that because you already went through some issues and I felt that would have been intrusive. Having said that, 
I also wanted you to make use of your background. This one was more intriguing. I wanted to look at the dolls, not for my personal reasons, but they were more engaging, more colorful, and there were you on that screen. One thing I would do differently is if you look at your screen, like both you and I right now are a bit offset. You are more offset than I am because it feels like you're levitating. You've got superpowers, not the powers of presentations at the moment, but you know, like you're so, it's so much into the doll that you're celebrating. Having said that, this is what I was looking forward as well. You also mentioned a few tools, namely OBS. OBS, yes, it can be a challenge, but with OBS, you could have done something like this, like be very, very visual, or you could have been with the visual along on screen, or even better, there were a lot of elements where I was looking forward to, to read from the screen. All those recommended that don't have too many words. This particular speech required the words to be there. And this kind of presentation would have really helped. Does it take a little bit of work to be physically and visually present and OBS? Yes, it does, but it's not that lot, that much. Now, in terms of what I enjoyed, Andy, your spoken words were clear. So despite that visual situation, you didn't lose me because I was taking notes. The vocal presence was there. It wasn't too much. It, it wasn't too engaging. It was right because the focus of your delivery was your visual presentation. The eye contact, although you were trying to to keep the eye contact, I felt neglected at times, so maybe that's room for improvement, although that's no th that is not the focus of the speech. Same thing with the hand gestures. Having said that, despite everything that you were going through, you came across as cool as cucumber on screen. That's the one thing I'm struggling to work on. So, and Andrew, keep doing what you're doing, keep sharing the information, and hey, have a try at OBS. Back to you, Mr. John Evaluate. Thank you, Christian, for that thorough and comprehensive report. Moving on now to our second evaluation. Our second speaker, of course, was Tricia Smith, and the evaluation is going to be provided by Jim Barber. Uh, and I know that Jim has been taking screenshots because I can see one has just magically appeared. Jim, it's all yours. Thank you, Mr. General Evaluator. Everybody out there in cyberspace, and especially, of course, Toastmaster Tricia Smith. Tricia, the title of your presentation was Good Communication Requires a Plan. I could paraphrase that into saying that a good speech requires not just a plan, but thorough preparation. And you showed that, you demonstrated that in your presentation this evening. You nailed it. Briefly, the things that you did right, because I could just spend so much time on this, your video, your use of the video frame was top notch, your lighting was great, your overall video presence was, was terrific, I loved that. Vocally, your vocal strength, your vocal variety, these things were fantastic. Your speech itself, the speech structure, your use vocabulary, your speech was well written, your content was great, it was informative, everything was so good. And that brings me to three small, very small suggestions. Your speech was in some ways too good. For example, eye contact. Your eye contact, we worked on this ahead of, the, ahead of your speech. We were in the breakout room, and we found that when you were looking at the camera, it actually looked a little awkward. When you were looking people in the eyes, that didn't work either. But we found the sweet spot. We were played with it a little bit, and we found the right place for you to look, and you nailed that. Most of the time, you were talking to our audience, not by looking them in the eye. Congratulations. But you didn't do it all the time. So congratulations on trying it and on doing it a lot of the time. Work on doing it all the time because occasionally you drop down and you looked people in the eye like I'm doing right now and that doesn't work. You need to raise it up and look people in the virtual eye, which is not the same thing. Second minor thing, your back, 
background. I love your background, but you or yourself are slightly out of focus. That's a situation with your camera. I doubt that there's anything that you can do about that. And it's really not a problem, except that your background is in perfect focus. And so it's a little bit distracting. If you could keep the same background, I like that, but blur it just a little bit so that you don't are you're not overshadowed by the background, it would work a little bit better. The third thing, your speech, as I say, was very well presented. It was very well written. If anything, the problem is it was too good. You need, it, in order to connect with your audience, you need to be conversational. And you were conversational at times, but at other times, it sounded a little bit rehearsed. It sounded like you had prepared, over-prepared for your presentation. And so you were reading it or memorizing it. And instead, you weren't just talking to us. Now, you did come through. You said at one point, I'm a very systematic person. And the way you said that, it was obvious that you were speaking from the heart, wanted to hear that sort of conversational tone throughout your presentation. So this was a very good three and a half star presentation. Make these little thing, little improvements to it, and it'll be up to four stars. This was very good. Congratulations. Looking forward to the next one. Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you, Jim. Our third evaluation tonight is going to be of David's presentation about the pitfalls or stage falls, as the case may be, of speaking. And to present that, here's Carl Walsh. Well, first of all, David, it was certainly appropriate to your audience in cyberspace here tonight, uh, your, your topic. I, I really like the fact that you stood up, too, and that you left yourself room to move around. It's not called stand up for nothing. <laughs> it works better that way. So great, well, well done there. And, and of course, we've all died on stage, right? All of us have at one time or another, or in my case, many times or, or another. So uh, this was something that, that was close to our heart, but you could have had some fun with that too, just to throw some, some things in, in there. If, if, if you Google around some of these things, for instance, in the theater world, one of our favorite stories is the death of the great actor Edmund King in uh, England, where at the end of a performance of Macbeth, he collapsed actually on stage when the, when the curtain came down. He was having trouble breathing and his people came to him and said, Mr. Keene, Mr. Keene, this must be terribly difficult for you. And he answered, Dying is easy, comedy is hard. And that is one of our absolute favorite. And you know, you could you could use things like that. You had really good pacing and energy that I've never seen from you before, David. Really good. I, I, I really like that. I, I I will say that economy of words would would help you just a little bit really sharpen your, your sentences when you're doing comedy. And my Gosh, your main topic, which is the crocodile that ate Stockholm, Sweden. What a great topic. And how much fun could, could you have, have had with that just by going to a thesaurus? So I did real quickly. And every time you mentioned Stockholm, you could have said crocodile infested Stockholm, crocodile beset Stockholm. Crocodile crowded Stockholm, cr crocodile overwhelmed Stockholm, change it up every time and, and, and make it more and more ri ridiculous every, every time. That would have been a lot of fun. So, you know, play, play with your topic, play with the words even more than you did. And is it me or could there be some really great visuals of a crocodile in Stockholm, Sweden? <laughs> something in the background there that could have been great the only other thing that that i would say that lamp in the background there very a little distracting so you might want to do something about that but i gotta tell you this was a fun fun presentation david uh all all i'm talking about is to let your imagination run wild and have even more fun with it blow it up have have, have a good time and we'll have it with you. 
Back to you, Mr. General Evaluator. Thank you, Carl. Yes. Blow up the crocodile, perhaps. Turn it into mm. belts. No, that's, well, that's right. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much for that, uh, for all three of our evaluators. Now, can I get the times, please, Madam Timekeeper, for the three evaluators? I see they've gone into the... Uh, uh, and all three are eligible. Only by the hair of his chinny chin chin for Christian, but they are all eligible. So uh, if you, Lou, would like to put the vote option into the chat, then everyone can chat. But while you're doing that, you're also a grammarian. So did you take note of anybody who was using the use of the uh, word of the day? I sort of did, Mr. General Evaluator. My apologies as I was... <laughs> Still kind of learning on the fly some of the aspects of the contest voting tool. I did catch Rick and David. I guess, Mr. General Evaluator, I must have been in cyberspace myself when I was kind of trying to record all this. So now you can add me to that list as well. If I missed anyone, please raise your hand. My apologies. Otherwise, back to you, Mr. GE. We've got a couple of extras. That's all right. It's a, a word that we can all use because we all understand. Time now to move on to the reports of the functionaries. Isn't that a wonderful word? Uh, please try to keep these short because we are running perilously close to out of time. Our watcher this evening was... Uh, that was Marianne, wasn't it? Yes. Yes, it was. Uh, I have to say everyone is positioned properly. We have... Uh, Andre, Graham, Andy, and Kim, who were on theme for tonight with their backgrounds. I will caution people to be careful. Now, Andy, I know you were having some technical difficulties, but you're sitting there like this. So when people are speaking, that could be a distraction. And I did notice a lot of people putting their hands by their face. So again, watch the expression on your face. Try and keep it pleasant because a lot of us have, I don't know if anyone knows what RBF is, but some of them have, some people have that and you're kind of thinking and watching and not looking so pleasant when you're uh, on screen. So watch your facial expressions, try and keep it pleasant and back to you, Graham. Thank you, thank you. Now our R counter, actually no, no, there might be a couple more R's coming up from the chat monitor. So we'll check that first, the chat monitor, Rick. Uh, you're, I don't know whether you're muted or I'm muted or. Can anybody else know? There you go. Not much to report. My, everybody seemed to be doing chat pretty much appropriately. I, the only thing I can say, so that the off counter has something to work with, uh, back to you. <laughs> Thank you. I knew you'd put at least one in there. And talking of our counters, uh, Donna, how do we go? We did very well gliding across cyberspace today. We, I have put a few comments to one and two people in the chat, so pay attention to that in order to save time. But I must highlight Toastmaster Carr on his use of R, uh, which was well placed. Not all the time R's are bad. You know, when he said, ah, uh, Florida, well used. Thank you. Watch out for the repetitions and you can improve by concentrating when you're talking every day. Back to you, Mr. Evaluator. Thank you. Time now, how uh, we've got a couple more seconds to uh, vote for best evaluator. So while those votes are coming in, a couple of brief observations from me on the meeting. First, the Toastmaster of the day, Kim Leeming. There's a phrase or a quote from Norman Vincent Peale, which goes, there is real magic in enthusiasm. It spells the difference between mediocrity and accomplishment. And enthusiasm was my word of the day for our Toastmaster. Kim, you were enthusiastic, you were warm, you were welcoming, you were mostly in control. There were a couple of times when things didn't go quite according to plan, but that's why we're here at Toastmasters. I really, really enjoyed your role as Toastmaster tonight. And uh, particularly since I know you haven't done it often, uh, particularly in this club, so well done. I, I, I had a ball. For the evaluators, a bit of feedback. Uh, Christian, the evaluation of Andy, some really good praise and also some good recommendations. Might I suggest that when somebody is going to be giving a presentation where the visuals are all important, as evaluators, we might suggest to the speaker that they have a second monitor so that they can see what they look like, because that would have been Andy's big problem. He can't see 
what the rest of us see because his screen is going to have other things. So if you're going to be doing this style of presentation, you might, for example, suggest to the speaker that they have a second monitor which just shows what they're doing. Jim pointing to uh, the need for structure and preparation in the speech showed that with his evaluation. Well done. Good specific advice on eye contact and on visuals. A little incoherent. Yeah, I don't know whether you're aware of this, Jim, but you actually used the phrase, this speech was too good twice during your evaluation. You started to mention it, went off on a tangent, then came back to it, which took up a little extra time. And um, Carl, Carl, there was a lot of second person in this. David, you did this. David, you did that. Part of the, the role of an evaluation is for everybody to benefit. And so what I would suggest we all look at doing is try to go from the second to the third person occasionally so that you make it more overhead, but still give specific recommendations and specific commendations to the speaker, which is something that Carl did well done on that. Uh, the praise was so on point tonight, as was the advice, particularly the economy of words. So well done to all three of our evaluators. Well done to everybody in the meeting. Time now to get a uh, result from our timekeeper. Uh, no, from Thank our you. vote counter. Sorry. Very good. Thank you, sir, Mr. GE. Okay, votes are as complete as we're going to get them. Best table topic speaker is Toastmaster Starmans. Woohoo! Very good, Birgit. Our best evaluator award goes to Toastmaster Ramchurn. Congratulations, Christian. And our best speaker, drum roll please, is someone who has shown us a side of himself that we hope to see more of, Toastmaster David Carr. Excellent, thank you for that. That's all I have as general evaluator. Madam Toastmaster, do you have anything or should we hand it straight to the president to wrap us up? Um, thank you, Graham, and thanks to everyone for filling my night with wonderful speeches in cyberspace. And thanks for demonstrating what a small world it really is. And back to you, Lou, Mr. President. Thank you, Madam Toastmaster, and I could not agree more with Graham. Talk about enthusiasm, enthusiasm, enthusiasm. I really enjoy your running of a meeting like uh, our Toastmasters Thank meeting you. on Monday nights. Wonderful job. Okay, Thank we, you. uh, you're quite welcome. I'm gonna officially close the meeting now because we are running a few minutes over. Whoever, I don't have host uh, capability, whoever can turn off the recording, please do so. So 